Yeah, like out of gravity. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think it worked out to be in a bigger space, man. This would have been crazy in a small space. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Are you happy to be here? Awesome. Well, we're glad to welcome you into the WRL 3D Theater tonight. We had a little bit of change of venue. How many of you have been to more than one science cafe in the past? OK, yeah. Lots of folks in the crowd come to the Science Cafe. So normally, we're meeting over in the Daily Planet Cafe. That's a cool space, right? You can get dinner or a drink. But yesterday, a water main broke on McDowell Street. So as of like 6 o'clock tonight, we didn't have potable water. So you didn't want a cup of coffee tonight from the Daily Planet Cafe. You didn't want to do that. So you know, fortunately, we have a great big museum here. We've got lots of great spaces where we can host events like the WRL 3D Theater. So uh, if you're at home watching online, welcome. We have a little bit of a change of venue. And my name is Chris Smith. I am the host for the Science Cafe. For anyone who's new, welcome to the museum. Thanks for coming out. We're actually here in the museum somewhere every single Thursday night with our Science Cafe series where we bring in guest speakers from all around the Triangle community to come in and chat with us about what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, researching and studying. And then the best part of our Science Cafe is that we turn it around and we give the better part of an hour to the audience to ask questions of the experts that we've brought in. So we get their presentation, we learn a little bit about what they're interested in, and then I know that all of you have, you know, maybe you, you read an article online, you saw something on the news, but there's information about these topics sort of rattling around in your brain, and we bring an expert in to help get everything sort of lined up and help us learn more about what's going on in the natural world. And tonight's topic, we have Dr. William V. Suete from UNC Chapel Hill's Gilling School of Public Health. And I thought about asking by show of hands how many people have experience with tonight's topic. Air quality. Tonight's topic is air quality. Where are y'all at? Yeah, so I was looking at the information about tonight's talk, and it'd be really easy to just say, ah, oh, this talk is all about marijuana. That's, yeah, whatever, okay. It's all hot and in the news right now. You know, we've got several states in the U.S. legalizing it, the whole country of Canada. But with things like that happening, you end up with an industry, billions of dollars being spent on products. And beyond the end use of these products, they have lives before that, and that can have an impact on the environment. So tonight's guest, I think, is going to give us a little bit of insight into more than just the end use of these kinds of products, but into really what goes into them and what their impacts can be. So put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Dr. William V. Suete. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also thank you to the uh, uh, North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences uh, for allowing me to talk here. It's uh, quite an honor. and I, I, I remember bringing my little kids here, and uh, I've always loved this place, so I'm really happy to be here. So yes, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was a great warm-up for the crowd. So yes, my name is William Vesuete. I'm at the UNC uh, School of Public Health. And just a little side, I'm on the Environmental Engineering and Science Department in the School of Public Health. We are the only School of Public Health with an engineering department. We know NC State has their engineers, but we also have some engineers up at UNC. And so I'm going to talk about, can the legalization of marijuana affect air quality, both in these facilities and in the region for a whole city? And so why are we talking about marijuana? Just as uh, introduced, they said that it's a growing industry. The entire country of Canada has now legalized uh, both medical and recreational marijuana. And here of the 50 states, uh, we can see there in the light green which ones have legalized it for recreational use, and in the dark green which ones have legalized it uh, for medical use. Uh, so this is a growing industry that's hitting lots and lots of more states. And those states that are in gray are in various uh, you know, states of uh, whether to fight it or legalize it at this point, right? Is that right? There you go. There we go. See, I even... Medicinal. See, I, even, I can't even keep up. It's happening so fast. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is mostly focusing on the state of Colorado. 
because they have an interesting uh, industry and how it impacts air quality. And what I have here is the, you know, the uh, state of Colorado, and in the green crosses are actually the retail uh, uh, um, facilities that grow marijuana, and the red ones are the medical ones. And these aren't the dispensaries. So, you know, you probably, if you've gone to Colorado, uh, you probably have noticed there's a whole bunch of dispensaries where they sell these products, right? And somebody once told me that there are actually more dispensaries than Starbucks uh, in the state of Colorado, right? And you can look around, there's a lot of it. But this isn't what I'm showing here. What I'm showing here are the places that actually grow the plants before they're delivered to the dispensary for the user to use. Now, some of these dispensaries are co-located with these facilities, and some of them aren't, right? And if you look just in 2015, they already reached a $1 billion in sales. That's just in the state of Colorado. That's bigger than construction. That's bigger than core. Right? From 2016 to 2015, they had a 45% increase in their revenues. And it hasn't let up. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is a massive, massive industry. Right? And so how is it grown in Colorado? So what makes it unique in Colorado is that they have to grow these plants in a secure location. They have to be able to secure it. That was part of the deal of allowing the legalization of marijuana. It's heavily regulated by you know, where the plant goes from the seed or the clone rather all the way to the end user. So they follow a lot of that. As a result of that, all the legal marijuana growth decided to, most of it to go into warehouse space, right? So good luck if you're a business and you want to get some warehouse space in Denver. Forget about it. Almost every single square foot of warehouse space in Denver has been converted over to giant growing facilities, right? Because the warehouse folks can get a far better premium per square footage for growing marijuana than they can get for uh, storing goods, right? So think about this. Massive warehouses, huge warehouses full of literally thousands and thousands of plants, right? All growing and, and doing. So how does it work? So here's a picture of one here on the left, right? And so what we have here is an indoor grow facility. And they, the way marijuana, so I learned actually a lot about how the marijuana is grown. So first you get a clone, and under 24-hour light and controlled at elevated CO2 conditions, they control relative humidity, they control temperature, uh, and in tons of light for 24 hours a day, they do the growing stage of the marijuana, right? Then they go to the next room where they flower it, right? And how they do that is instead of 24-hour seven lights, they go from a 12-hour on to a 12-hour off. 12 hour on to 12 hour off. And that uh, signals to the plant to start budding flowers. And once it starts budding flowers, it then starts creating the bud, and it's that bud that ends up going into the consumer product. So here on the third is the next room where they start drying the stuff, right? So a lot of these facilities have partitioned their warehouses into several different growing rooms, where one half, one quarter of it's growing, another quarter of it's uh, budding and flowering, another quarter of it's um, um, being dried, and maybe another core is being used to do um, solvent selection, right? So imagine all these massive uh, warehouses full of thousands and thousands of plants. And they are heavily secure, lots of security guards, lots of security around those. Um, so I'll tell you a second, I was actually in Denver and I did some sampling, and just being on the sidewalk trying to measure outside these facilities, like within seconds I would have security on me saying, what are you doing here? I was like, just measuring, man. <laughs> all right, so. So what do we know about marijuana growing, right? Colorado is not the first place to do it. We've had medical marijuana for a while, uh, and people have been studying a little bit about this industry. But mainly the focus has been on its electricity use, because it is a massive use of electricity. Also on its water use, right? How much water these plants take up. And as well as the use of pesticides and how these pesticides uh, and fertilizers may impact water pollution. People have been looking at that and doing it, but nobody has been paying attention to the impact that the growing of these plants may have on both indoor and outdoor air quality, right? And that's really the question that I wanted to figure out and try to tackle. Now, before we get into why that is, we're gonna have to do a little bit of science. So, you know, this is a science cafe, so I can do this with you all, all right? So here we go, all right. So there's a term I wanna, it's probably the most complicated term we're gonna have on all the slides. Volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Uh, you may have heard of VOCs in consumer products. Gasoline is a VOC, toluene is a VOC. These are all kind of man-made VOCs. That aromatic smell that you smell from gasoline, those are actually compounds called aromatics, which is a type of a volatile organic compound. But it also turns out that VOCs, and normally they're gases, right? They're gases that go into the, into the atmosphere or are emitted from evaporation of gasoline or the evaporation of all the uh, liquid products you have in your car as it you know, idles and all that stuff. So we've known that for a, a long time. 
What we also learn in around 1980 was that plants also produce volatile organic compounds, right? And this is a huge discovery in our field right around 1980. And it's what prompted our then President Reagan, who famously said, why should we regulate cars? Trees pollute more than cars. And he was actually absolutely correct. If I took all the natural volatile organic carbons, VOCs, and I took them in for the whole planet and I summed them up, and I take all the man-made um, VOCs that we, we produce and we summed them up globally, the amount of VOCs that come from plants is a whole order of magnitude, a, th a 10 times more than uh, what we uh, produce as, as VOCs. Now, the issue is, and where this Reagan was being trying to be clever, is that most of the ma natural made volatile organic carbons happened in the Amazon or in really rural areas where nobody lives, right? In the places that we live, which are the cities, it's dominated by man-made VOCs. So, you know, he was kind of being clever, right? But nevertheless, we figured out that um, plants produce these things. And you're actually quite familiar with a lot of these VOCs. That pine smell that we love so much is actually alpha pinene, a type of volatile organic carbon, a gas that's emitted from these plants. Uh, linalool is lavender. Myrcene is that clove smell. beta carophyllene limonene, that lime smell comes from a compound called limonene, right? These are all volatile organic carbons or gases that are actually emitted from the plants. Now, as it turns out, every living thing on this planet emits volatile organic carbons. Right now, every single one of you is emitting in your breath a VOC that's called isoprene, right? It's a volatile organic gas. It comes when we're, from the, you know, the, uh, when we're moving around and our muscles are burning things, we just expel it in our breath. Plants also produce a whole bunch of isoprene, right? And in fact, I just saw a, a, a study recently where uh, these folks over in, I think it's Max Planck's, um, we were able to measure this isoprene, right? Because that's what we have to do in the atmosphere. And so they set up one of these measurements in a movie theater, right? And they brought a whole bunch of people into the movie theater and they showed a movie, right? And they showed a movie that's a thriller and they showed a movie that was a comedy or something like that, right? And what they did is they measured the increases of isoprene as a result of the audience watching. And what they found was people who were watching these horror movies would fidget around or jump up like that or move around and, and accelerate a heartbeat. And as a result of that, they expel more isoprene. So what these folks were trying to do is they're trying to calibrate this isoprene expulsion to, with uh, movie ratings, right? Should this be rated R or should it be NC-17? We can look at the isoprene. Crazy, right? So anyway, so we've been studying this for a long time. We've known for a long time. And in fact, if you look at the southeast United States where we live, and you look at the isoprene that comes from the plants, mostly trees in the southeast, in the summer, we had the same emissions of isoprene, that VOC that comes from natural trees, as the Amazonian rainforest. Now, the Amazonian rainforest does it all year, right? But here it's mostly in the summer. But that's a massive amount of gases that come from trees. Overwhelms all the other VOCs that are made by man-made. So much so that if you look at the city of Atlanta, Atlanta is in right in the middle of Georgia. It's right in the middle of this ocean of VOCs that are made naturally. Prior to 1980, we didn't have a good handle on how much natural made VOCs. And so we, we came up with control strategies in Atlanta that turned out to be ineffective. They concentrated on trying to reduce man-made VOCs when in fact most of the air was flooded with natural made VOCs. And so in the 80s when we figured out and, and quantified that natural made, they had to switch controls in order to, to mitigate land. So, so we've known that these plants, and we've been studying these plants for a long time, you know, mostly uh, uh, pine trees and, and plants and things like that for this, right? Okay, so why do we care about these volatile organic compounds? Are they harmful? Uh, no, not by themselves actually. So, you know, smelling limonene and, and smelling that pine smell by itself isn't harmful at all to you, right? However, they react in the atmosphere. And so here's the second part of the science that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about atmospheric chemistry, which is my favorite subject, right? And this is what I study. All right, so what we know is when you have VOCs, right? Here's our VOCs coming from our plants, right? And we call those biogenic sources, which mean plant sources. And they go in the atmosphere in the day, right? So we have sunlight. And then they get mixed with something called anthropogenic NOx. So NOx are nitrogen oxides, NO and NO2, all right? And they're made from combustion. So what actually happens is you have a flame, it breaks apart those ni N2 nitrogen and oxygen molecules, and they reconnect together into NOx. That catalytic converter that you have in all our cars are converting that NOx into something that's not NOx, right? Because we know NOx contributes to air quality, okay? 
Right, so what, and, and so you can see here about half of the nation's NOx comes from motor vehicles, about a quarter comes from uh, utilities, so burning coal, things like that. Uh, industry is about 10% and 5% is like wildfires and things like that. So anytime there's a flame, you're producing this NOx. Now what happens in the atmosphere is that these VOCs, whether they're man-made or biogenic, react with um, the sun and the NOx and they form smog and particles, okay? Now we're actually quite familiar with this process. You guys, you know what this place is up here? Wait, wait, oh, sorry, back, wrong button. You know where that is? Anybody know where that is? That's Smoky Mountains, right? You know why it's uh, called the Smoky Mountains? Because of that smoke? That's actually reactions in aerosols. So the VOCs that are coming from all those trees, and in, in the mountains, there's not a lot of NOx, although you know, sometimes we drive there, but most of that NOx is natural. It's coming from the ground. Right? So it's a different source of NOx, but it's the same chemistry that happens, right? So the sun reacts with the VOCs, volatile organic carbons, and the NOx, and they form aerosols. And then those aerosols scatter the light, and that's what gives it that white haze, okay? We see the same thing in cities, right? That's, uh, that's actually Atlanta, Georgia, right? And so we see that haze on cities, so that's because there's aerosols that are there that are scattering the light and causing it. Now, if that's a brown haze, that means there's a lot more man-made anthropogenic VOCs that are involved, right? If it's a white haze, it's more of a biogenic, solely dominated VOCs, right? So that's why you see the white haze in the mountains, and if you go to a major city, you see a lot of this brown haze, okay? Fina, you know, you name the major city, you've seen it, right? Now, that occurs because of reactions, right? So we have reactions with the sun, the VOCs and the NOx, they come together, they mix around, and they form this stuff. We've known this for a long time, and this has been you know, well studied in our field. We have models that predict this. Uh, we have instruments that measure this occurrence that are happening, right? So, can, it, marijuana's a plant, isn't it, right? And now we all know that marijuana could produce, uh, that plants produce volatile organic carbons. So the question is, does marijuana plants do? Right? And we're putting all these marijuana plants um, and growing all these, right? And we know that plants produce gases, and we know that these gases can react and form both ozone, smog, and particulate matter, aerosols in the atmosphere, right? So I started looking in the literature, and guess what? There's not a single thing on what's being emitted by these plants, right? There's a lot of stuff of what's in these plants, right? Because we're going to smoke it, right? They need to know the terpene concentration, the fungi. You know, they do lots of stuff characterizing the plant and the plant material, but very little on the gases that are being emitted. And in fact, the only study that I found was uh, one where they, <laughs> this is a group of, re I wish I would have been in this one, a group of researchers followed DEA agents, and as soon as the DEA agents busted an illicit uh, marijuana facility, they went in there and started measuring for terpenes, right? <laughs> and sure enough, they measured terpenes. They saw uh, terpenes, which, I'm sorry, is a type of volatile organic compounds, one of those VOCs. So sure enough, they measured those in these facilities. Well, that's different than what's happening in Colorado, right? Um, and we've probably never been in an illicit marijuana growing facility, but they, you know, they're not taking best practices and you know, fully regulating, right? You know, not like the industry scale that we're seeing in, uh, in, in Denver. Okay, so you know, there's some preliminary evidence that may suggest that you know, there's these plants. Okay, well, how do I figure out what's going on here, right? Oh, and one more bit of information. So these are actually the uh, growing facilities um, in downtown Denver. And you can see here, this is uh, Interstate 70 that goes east-west right through downtown. And then the other is Interstate I-25 that goes north-south, right? And at the confluence of those two interstates is downtown Denver, right? Now, if you're a warehouse, where do you want to put your warehouses? As close to transportation hubs as you can. So all those warehouses are right along that interstate, I-25 and I-7. There's a huge concentration of them in Denver, right? Now, what do we just learn about um, VOCs and NOx? When they mix together in the sun, they're going to make air pollution, right? Well, guess what all those highways are producing? Tons of NOx, lots and lots of NOx. And not only that, the confluence of these two interstates is probably the hottest NOx concentrations in the whole city of Denver, right? And now, all of a sudden, we decided to put a whole bunch of VOCs where they weren't before, right smack dab in the middle of downtown Denver. Now, if I wanted to make ozone in particular matter, that this is what I would do, right? I'd find a place with a lot of NOx, and I'd put a bunch of VOCs there, and I'll cook up a bunch of air pollution. So I looked at that, and I thought, whoa, you know, this could be a problem. One other thing we should know. So these are all what we call non-attainment areas, so the EPA, sets a standard that says you shall not exceed this air pollution concentration. And if you do, you have to come up with controls to bring that back down to a safe level, okay? 
All these counties that are on this map are places where um, the, are violating the ozone standard, which is a, a type of air pollution, right? And if we look right here in Colorado, right, you can see that Denver is a non-attainment area, right? So they're already classified what we call moderate, right? So here's the scale right here. So it's marginal, then moderate, serious, severe, and extreme. Here we are in North Carolina, right? That's Charlotte, and right? Charlotte is marginal, okay? Uh, I do a lot of work in Houston, and they're, they're, they're marginal as well, right? So Denver is close to, you know, they don't want any more ozone, right? <laughs> so I said, hey, state of Colorado, <laughs> you might have a problem. <laughs> Let me study this problem and figure out whether we should be worried about this, right? Because um, the last thing they want to do is make air quality worse in a place that's already have somewhat bad air quality. All right, so how do we do that, right? Okay, so that was the science part. We got through it together. I think we're okay, right? All right, so next part is how do we figure out whether this is a problem, okay? What kind of tools, science tools, do we have to allow us to predict whether this is going to be a problem or not, right? So we can use air quality models, right? So an air quality model takes in all these emissions, it takes in the sun, takes in the winds, takes in all the chemistry, and predicts where and when ozone and aerosols and smog form, right? So I could run a model in, in Denver, predict the ozone, and then add all the facilities, marijuana facilities, rerun that air quality model and see what sort of difference it makes, right? Now, and so where do you get the air quality model? As it turns out, because of the Clean Air Act, if you're a state that is in non-attainment, remember we just learned non-attainment of a standard, the Clean Air Act says in the law that you have to use an air quality model to show whatever controls you're going to do now in the future are going to work. I call it the Full Employment Act, because this is what I do, uh, research air quality and models, right? It's awesome. So anyway, but as it turns out, Denver, uh, is, since they're in non-attainment, have an air quality model that they're using to uh, justify policy with. And in that air quality model, there's not a single emission of marijuana in there, not a single one, right? So I'm working now with the state of Colorado, and I said, give me that air quality model. I have it now on my servers at UNC, and we run these models on our supercomputing clusters uh, at UNC. Uh, and then, but... Now I need to figure out, well, how much uh, VOCs from these plants are being emitted, right? That's the next question. I got the tool to predict it. Now I need to figure out how to do that, right? So how do we do that? Well, there's two kind of approaches to doing what we call inventory building, right? So I'm building up my inventory of emissions of these VOCs that are coming from these, those facilities that we saw, right? So we could do a bottom-up approach where we I figure out each plant, each plant's emissions, and I multiply that by all the plants in the facility, and then I multiply that across the facilities, and I use that to enter my air quality model, and then I make my predictions. The other way is to measure at the facility, in, in and out of the facility, and try to come up with a factor by facility, right? So those are the two approaches that are gonna be using here to try to calculate how much emissions are coming from these facilities, right? All right, so remember I said back in the 80s, we found out that uh, there's all these VOCs that are coming from plants. And in the last subsequent 30 years, we've developed techniques and methods to measure these emissions. So there's folks at EPA that have the lucky job of going around the world, like to the Amazon, hanging out in the forest and, met, and putting bags over trees and measuring its, its emissions, right? That was a nice gig for a while when it lasted, right? But as a result of that, we've developed some um, uh, good methods for determining this stuff. Now, nobody's ever applied these methods to marijuana, okay? So I had this idea, right? And so you know, I hope I convinced you that you know, this could be an issue in Colorado. And I was able to convince the National Center for Atmospheric Research also that this is going to be a problem. And as a result of that, they paid for me to spend a summer in Boulder, Colorado to study this. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's not a bad gig, I got to tell you. All right? So I went over to Boulder. I spent three months there. I bought a bunch of marijuana plants. Now, as it turns out, I can't bring them into the national, it's legal, don't, it's, I can do that, right? I can't do it here, but I can do it there. You can buy up to 20 plants legally at a time. Now, as it turns out, I can't bring those plants into a federal facility because they're a federally illicit substance, right? The National Center for Atmosphere Research is a federally funded lab. <laughs> so they allow me to do the research, but they said, well, you can't bring those plants in the lab. It's like, all right, so I set up in a garage at a friend's house. <laughs> We put up a bunch of lights, so we had a bunch of clones, and we started growing these things. I had the NCAR scientists come to the garage, and they brought their leaf enclosure measurements, they brought their canisters, right? And what we do is we actually enclose the plant in a, in a, what we call a Teflon uh, film bag, 
right? And we then pressurize the bag, we purge the outside air from it, and then we suck the air from the bag, right? And so the only air that we're uh, um, sucking up is the air that's coming uh, from the, uh, sorry about that, coming from the plant itself. We then use these tubes to absorb those gases into the tubes, and then we brought the tubes into the federal lab, because they don't care what, you know, it's just a gas at that point, right? It's not a federally illicit substance. We then run those tubes into our instruments, and what the instruments will tell us is the composition of those gases, right? So with, uh, with this and knowing the plant weight and the plant life, we're able to calculate what is the emission rate and actually what sort of VOCs are coming from these plants. Now, we looked at four different strains, right? One of them, I, I'm not a very good marijuana grower, evidently, so only three of the strains survive, right? Um, but that's all right. So if we look at the three strains, here are the names of them. I love these names. It's Critical Mass, right? Lemon Wheel, and Rockstar Kush, right? <laughs> I, was, there was a, I had published, so this is from a publication. I actually got this through Peer Review Journal, right? And it was funny because the, um, uh, in my department, uh, there's a PR person, and so they, they wanted to write a story about it. And I got a call from the writer. She said, never in my whole life as a science writer, I thought I could write the word Kush in an article. <laughs> she was so excited. So anyway, so here are the three strains, right? And so we did, uh, we grew the plants. We had four different strains. We did the leaf enclosure measurements. And what I'm showing here are the emissions, right, on the y-axis up and down. So this is the rate of emissions of, of the VOCs. And then on the x-axis are the three different strains. And I also told you we can tell the composition, right? So I've broken this up by composition. So karyophylline is a type of VOC. Eucalyptol is a type of VOC. It comes from eucalyptus plants, right? But it also comes from marijuana. And monoterpenes are a type of uh, class of VOCs, right? So these are all VOCs. So what did we learn from this study? Well, as it turns out, the amount of VOCs that are being put, emitted by the plants varies by strain. Right? And not only that, we also learned that the composition of the gases that are coming off these plants also vary by strain. We had no idea. This is actually the first leaf enclosure measurement of these plants ever done, right? So we had no idea what to expect. And as it turns out, there are over 162 strains in Colorado, right? So this, this is literally like, oh, man, <laughs> what are we going to do now? All right, so we, we have this, right? And now the other way to do it is to go to facilities and measure this. So once I went to NCAR in the summer and I was working for them, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment started hearing about what I'm doing, and they started to say, hey, what's going on? And so as it turns out, we got some pilot funding from the state, um, from the uh, Colorado State, not Colorado, the state of Colorado, uh, to go into facilities. Now, I can't go into facilities because, you know, they're not going to let some – you know, some guy from <laughs> walk of the street in there, but the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment can, right? And so with them, we're, we're going to go and visit two or three facilities and, you know, try to figure out a way to calculate the emissions that are coming from these facilities into the atmosphere. Okay. So what's the next step, right? Well, the next step is then to use these air quality models, right? And so um, uh, you know, this is kind of the area of research that I mainly deal with is are these regional scale and global scale air quality models, right? And um, how these air quality models work um, is we can um, model everything from the climate, uh, from the globe to the hemisphere. Uh, we can zoom in uh, and do the entire United States, right? Uh, and we can zoom in even further and do like uh, within the state here or zoom in even within the region and the city, right? And in all these models, we're modeling the wind. We're modeling the emissions, the cars, where they are, rush hour, uh, industrial power plants, all those biogenic emissions, all that's thrown into this model. Everything you can think of that is impactful on air quality are thrown in these models. And they're full three-dimensional models, right? And they're huge. Uh, and we have to run them on, on computing clusters of you know, hundreds of processors to run it. Um, I can run, like for recently, we can run a whole simulation. Or we can run three months in, was it, I think, six days, something like that, right? So, you know, six days and lots of computing cluster time. So these are big models that we're running to try to figure out what's going on, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a model that we currently have, and this is a model that's been um, you know, vetted by the state of Colorado. I spent millions of dollars trying to get this model to work perfectly, right? And then I'm going to take this model and I'm going to add my marijuana emissions to it, the growing of these VOCs, right? and I'm going to run it. So here's the modeling domain that I'm using, right? So we model the whole United States, and then we zoom in in a higher and higher resolution uh, into Colorado, okay? So what do I need to build my inventory? There's a few questions I have to answer, right? Well, first, I need to know what my emission rate and composition is. Well, so I did some of that work, luckily, right? But I only know it for a few strains. And the work that I found out is, is that it's variable by strain, and there's hundreds of strains. So, you know, I have some information on that, but it's really uncertain, right? I don't know exactly what to put in that. 
dry plant weight. Well, as it turns out, the emission rate that we calculate is a function of the plant weight, right? It's normalized by that. The bigger the plant weight, the more emissions, the smaller the plant weight, the smaller emissions, right? So I need to know what the plant weight is in order to calculate the amount of emissions that are coming. Well, as it turns out, that information isn't, you know, recorded by the industry. They, rec they record the weight after they take the buds off and, and they weigh that wa waste weight, right? So we don't have a lot of information on that. And like I mentioned, there's hundreds of strains in, in Colorado, right? So that's a lot of variability. And then plant counts. How many plants are there actually in each facility? Well, as it turns out, that's not publicly available data, right? The Department of Revenue has, but I can't get it from them, okay? What I do have is licenses, right? So they have to apply for a license, and they can grow up to so many plants in that license. So I have some information on that. Ventilation rates, right? So if they, you know, if we're in this room, you know, I'm really interested in what's going up into the atmosphere. So I need to know how much the exchange rate. And that varies by facility. There's some facilities, because I've spoken to quite a number of the owners, and I say, hey, how, how do you ventilate your stuff? Some folks have very sophisticated HVAC systems where they monitor each room independently. Other folks, I have a guy said to me, yeah, we, you know, we kind of wait till it gets really kind of stuffy in here, and then we open up all the windows and get it all out again. Right? So, you know, there's no set practices. There's no federal regulation on how to do this. I mean, if you were a, a gas station and you were degreasing engines with toluene, you better believe there's all kinds of regulations for capturing that toluene VOC before it goes into the atmosphere. Nothing for the marijuana industry at all, right? So that's another uncertainty that I have in my model, right? And also the operating conditions, right? You know, they optimize, you know, you know growing these marijuana plants isn't hard, right? Okay, so these guys have to differentiate themselves somehow, and they do that by their growing practices, right? I trim every two hours, I do the light like this, or I have this sort of soil, right? And that's how I differentiate my competition. But for us to understand what they're doing, they're very secretive as a result. So that makes it difficult for us to understand what sort of conditions they're at. That's changing now that we're working with the state agency, right? And we also know where the heck are these facilities, so I have that information at least. Okay. Now, with all that variability and uncertainty, right, uh, how do we, can we possibly put this into our model? So this is one of the science things that we have to deal with, right? Sometimes you just don't have all the data. Actually, a lot of the time, especially the research questions that, that we are trying to tackle, we have insufficient amounts of data. Now, do we give up and say, oh, forget about it? No, no way, all right? No, what we do is we use techniques to try to overcome that uncertainty. And one way to do that is what we call ensemble runs, where you run lots of different kind of possible combinations of all these uh, variables together and all kinds of sorts of possible reasonable ranges. And then you do a whole bunch of runs, right? And what we have here are nine different realizations of that inventory, you know, various, you know, what if the, you know, the emission factor was twice as much as what it was, or what if we had all these plants and twice as many plants, right? And you put all those together, and you let the model run, and you see how much emissions are going into the atmosphere. And that's what I'm showing here. And so what I have here are the nine, I took out nine non-modeling runs, so these are nine different runs. And then we have tons per year of, of biogenic plant VOCs. We all know what that is now, right? <clears throat> and in blue is where all the tons uh, per year of biogenic VOCs that were in the model before the marijuana industry was there. And the green is what the marijuana industry was there. Right? Now, as it turns out, there's not a lot of biogenic VOCs in Denver. It's a high desert, uh, if you didn't know that, right? And what they did is they put basically the Amazonian rainforest right in the middle of the downtown Denver, right? In the absolute best spot to make ozone, right? And so here's, you know, so you can up to, you know, a thousand times, eight times, seven times. I mean, there's a whole lot of VOCs that could be put into the atmosphere there, right? And here's a model run, right? So this is the difference between the model predictions of, of air quality, ozone, before the marijuana industry, and then the amount of ozone that's produced when I added it, and then we took the difference, right? And when you take the difference, this is all you see here is just the result of the marijuana industry. And you can see, so um, let me orient, orient you real quickly. So that's downtown Denver right there. That's I-70 I and I-25, right? And just as we expected, all the increases are actually right around where these facilities and emissions are. And as you increase the amount of emissions, it just keeps going up and up and up, okay? All right? And so, um, yeah, that's what happens, right? And it's actually quite linear. So what I have here is on the bottom, uh, you know, increases in cannabis emissions in thousands per tons per year, right? And then on the y-axis, I have the increase in ozone. And you can see for every 1,000 tons of uh, per, what is this? I forgot what it is, tons per year that you add, you get about, about a PPB of ozone, one part per billion, right? 
Now, just to give you a sense of what a part per billion is, uh, the current eight-hour average for ozone is 70 parts per billion, okay? And so, you know, <laughs> every little bit is going to hurt, uh, get, and they're, you know, right on the edge of that, that 70 parts per billion. Um, now, the other thing that we know, and this is just a slight chemistry thing, uh, it's linear because there are not a lot of VOCs in Denver. It's mostly tons of NOx. It's like the exact opposite of what we have here. Here in North Carolina, there's so much VOCs because of the trees. Uh, we're actually what we call NOx limited. So if we had more NOx, we'd make more ozone because there's tons of VOCs. In Denver, it's the exact opposite. There's tons of NOx because of the um, you know, mobile emissions and now the oil and gas and all that. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of VOCs. And so as you add more VOCs, you're going to make more ozone. Now, if you put these plants here in North Carolina and grew them outside in, you know, you know where I live, up in Carborough, right, uh, you're not going to see this relationship because it, the, the, you know, the addition of those VOCs is small compared to the total amount of VOCs. So this is very unique to this location, uh, and this chemistry is well known. Okay. So I'll end here. So marijuana VOCs do have the potential to impact regional air quality, right? We didn't know that before this, okay? And, and also... We have the tools predicted, so the model can do it, right? If we had the right inputs to the model, I can tell you how big of a public health concern we should be worried about with this thing, all right? So we have the tools predicted, but we lack the input data to reduce that uncertainty. I can give you that range and say, yeah, you know, a couple PBB, maybe four, five, ten, depending on how, how much terpenes there are, right? But we, we need that, right? Now, the other nice thing is that this is relatively easy to control and actually relatively inexpensive. We've been capturing VOCs from gas stations for a long time, right? So we know how to do it. Now, here's a business to someone who wants to be an entrepreneur. How you capture these things is with activated carbon, basically. So you, you know, run it through this activated carbon and it absorbs those chemicals and they don't come on the outlet, right? Now, all these carbon, what we call them carbon capture, carbon filters, really, uh, have been optimized for man-made VOCs. They have yet to be optimized for, you know, these terpenes that are coming from these marijuana plants. Someday down the future, the state of Colorado is going to have these marijuana facilities to have to capture these VOCs. The first person to figure out the most engineered and optimized way to capture those terpenes is standing to make a lot of money. So that was my tip for you all. All right. So now the other thing is, not only does this stuff we know react with the sun, what's inside these facilities? Well, there's these UV lights, which are basically acting like the sun. So Another hypothesis is, could we have this chemistry occurring inside these facilities? Could there be these aerosols that are being produced? And that has a health impact for the workers who are working in these areas, right? And nobody's looking at that quite yet. And so that's an area that I'd like to look into. And now I've been talking about ozone, but also remember from the beginning of my talk, we make aerosols, right? That haze that we see. So what's the contribution of these terpenes to those aerosols? So I'm doing those models right now as we speak. And then finally, What's the implication of an outdoor production, right? State of Washington, the state of California, they have outdoor grow operations, right? Would, could they impact regional? It's a much different problem and a different right, kind of chemistry. And, and so we have the models to predict that, and I would love to try to answer some more of those kinds of questions. Okay? All right. So that, I think that's it for me, right? So I'll take some questions now. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. All right. So yeah, let's, let's figure out what you want to know about this. So uh, the way it works uh, is you raise your hand, and I'll bring a microphone to you. I'll have a microphone, and I'll have a second microphone that's going to be over on that side. And Katie and I will try to shuttle the mics around to as many people as we can in the time that we have remaining. So I saw the first one right over here. Yeah, that was a very... Uh very interesting presentation, Thank you. and uh, I think I understood most of it. I was in that kind of business before I retired. But Denver was known as one of our few you know, two, I think, non-attainment areas originally because of the inversions. And I assume your use of the um, neurological <coughs> input data would take into account the inversion or stability or whatever. And I, and I guess my question is, what did you see in the results that you could contribute to a great degree to the likelihood of inversions in Denver versus if they weren't there? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, just to make sure everybody understands what, what we mean by inversion. So I was about um, to say, which, which business? <laughs> yeah, yeah, which of the two industries, right? <laughs> Air quality. Sure, sure. Um, 
So uh, when the sun rises, it starts to heat up the ground, right? And the ground heats up, and the air above the ground heats up. And when air is um, warmer, it becomes lighter, right, and starts to rise. And so you actually feel this when you're flying in an airplane. It's buffeted up and down in your seats. Those are rising, buoyant parcels of air that are going up. And as a result of that, it creates a big mixing, right? All right? And our models do capture that. In the winter, you, the ground gets colder than the air above it and causes the air to be cooler. In that case, it's not lighter than the air above it, and it has nowhere to go, right? And it stays low into the ground. And that's the inversion that he's talking about. And, a lot of, and that usually happens in the winter, right? Which is the opposite in the summer where you have these huge volume mixes, right? And the chemistry in those two places are much different. So things like particles that are emitted from cars and things like that, when you have an inversion, that concentrates all that stuff, right? Now, when you also have an inversion, you don't have a lot of light and a lot of, so the ozone chemistry and the secondary, the chemistry isn't as hot when we have an inversion. So it's much harder in the summer. So the stuff that we're seeing here is the result of reactions of VOCs that form that stuff, the chemistry, right? When you concentrate those VOCs without a lot of sun and chemistry, they're actually not that harmful, the VOCs by themselves. So it's the atmospheric chemistry when you have a lot of sun and a lot of mixing that, that's the bad actors. Hold on, say it into a microphone. Sorry, yeah, that, um, that's right. There's a temperature diagram. inversions in Colorado are, are like 24 hour period. So the, it'll be like 90 by the afternoon, by three o'clock it's raining, and by six o'clock you're in your winter coat. That's exactly right. And then in the summers, uh, you have this huge mixing during the day, and then it collapses at night and actually gets really small. So all those things are captured in these air quality models. So we get all those dynamics as part of that. Are the volatiles VOCs linearly related to the uh, carbon dioxide that they're using? Increased carbon dioxide for the plants, you get more VOCs? Yeah, so the, um, the terpenes are produced, um, the, the gases, the VOCs that are the gases, are, are produced either directly by the plant and then emitted, or they create these kind of pools of, of these oils, and, and then the oils evaporate, right? And in both those, yeah, they take in carbon dioxide to do that, and so in these elevated CO2 places, they have increased production of those emissions as a result. How many models do you have in operation currently? Um, so uh, that's a good question. So I actually run quite a number of models. Um, so the one that I'm doing for this is um, focused on the state of Colorado. So it runs for about a year, uh, and it's 2013, I think, is the year. So it's one whole year. And so it takes a lot of work to build up all that dynamics and all those inventories. So usually we just do one year, and we use that for all our questions, right? Um, I run another model that um, I look at the east coast of the United States, so that's kind of a different model. And then I have another model that looks at the whole hemispheric, and I ans answer different questions for that. And then we also have global models that measure the, uh, the model the whole planet. Each one of those models are used to ask and answer different kinds of science questions. How do you know, um, out of the three components of the strands, what affects them, like what makes one larger than the other? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really don't know. Uh, so the issue is that, as it turns out, these strains are, are genetically different, right? And, and just like uh, how trees are different, right? So, for example, a pine tree emits 100 times more isoprene. Uh, an oak tree, uh, sorry, let me say that again. An oak tree emits 100 times more isoprene than, say, a pecan tree. And the reason for that is this, the genetics of the plant themselves and how they produce and create the, you know, the plant itself and those kind of processes. So as it turns out, these strains are all kind of different for the end effect, right, for the amount of THC that's in there. But they also grow differently, and they grow in different ways. And, and as a result of that physiology, they produce different amounts of emissions, right? Um, and I don't know how much it may vary from all the other 157 strands that I haven't measured. They could maybe all are just those three. I don't know at this point. We need more data. Katie, my side's asking a lot more questions than your side. Yeah, <laughs> hey, so do you think that the emissions from the 
uh, growing facilities out in Colorado would be comparable to the ones at uh, somewhere in like in North Carolina where hemp is legal for CBD use? Right, so hemp is a, a little different than the marijuana plants that, that we're doing. Um, so again, they're a different type of plant, uh, and we have, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of data on what sort of gas emissions that come from those plants. Now, this operation that we have in Colorado is actually kind of unique, right, because it's indoor, it's in a warehouse, and it's, as a result of that, it's located in a very urban area. Um, if you brought these plants out to a rural area, they'll have much different uh, impacts on the air quality, right? And so the location of where they are is really important. Um, the size of the fields, for example, that are used outdoors are much larger than probably what can be done in an indoor facility, right? So that also may have different impacts as well. And so the best way to do that and to understand this is to run an air quality model to try to predict what it could happen. Oh, here we go. So do you think the uh, VOCs have a correlation to, say, bud density? Because your critical mass uh, had a lot larger on the scale, and I know that that's a, a larger yielder. So mm -hmm. compared to all the other ones, was that a correlation that you saw between the strains that you ran? Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, we know, uh, I didn't know about that part, so that's very but Yeah, so there's all, we do know that the, the density of the buds are vary by strain. We also know how quickly they grow vary by strain, even how they grow. Uh, it varies by strain, and all those things could impact this. And we didn't see a clear linear um, relationship with bud density and emission rate. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but it's definitely related to, and maybe somehow that might be the answer of the way, if we could come up with some kind of surrogate for these emissions, then we wouldn't have to do all 167 you know, in leaf emissions, right? And so, yeah, we're searching for that correlation. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, but for all of the future young engineers, um, these facilities are also going to have to have filtration on their HVAC systems as well, along with the cartridges that go on the workers, um, like masks and stuff. So I'm not in material engineering. My field is pharmaceutics, but that's definitely a thought as well going forward. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you can think of this facility as like, you know, a paint, if you have a paint shop, right, and you're painting things, um, there's VOCs that are coming off from painting, right? We capture those, we do those in enclosed areas, right? So I mean, this is no different, I mean, it's a different type of VOC, but the controls and the practices that we do to mitigate public health are the same, right? They need to be tweaked and optimized for this particular chemical, but the approaches are the same. Hi, so thank you, good presentation. I was curious about the VOCs emitted from the strains that you studied, are those, unique only to marijuana plants? Like do other, like how you said, pines or anything, emit those same ones? And is there, have you kind of compared what those strains emitted to, to normal pines? And it's like part two, like are they unique enough where you might be able to like classify plants by the emissions? Cause I know the strain names are funny, but when you get to regulation, there might like how the other guy was kind of saying, denser ones might emit more or less. So I didn't know if it was unique enough to to classify by that? Great question. So yes, we did look at this and how it compares to other plants and what they emit. And there are, this, these aren't unique um, biogenic VOCs. So they're not you know, something that we've never seen before, right? Um, now, if you look at the plant vegetation in Denver and look at the sort of things that those plants produce, they're very different than the sort of stuff that the marijuana produces. So if we see terpenes in these specific terpenes, now I'm, what we're, the, I didn't mention this, but what I also did in Boulder or Colorado is I went down to Denver and I started measuring outside facilities, right, in the ambient air. And so if we measure these particular terpenes that I measure in here, that could be a signature of, hey, these VOCs only can come from marijuana plants. Um, I was wondering about the effects of these terpenes on humans. And then my second part is, um, have you done anything to um, – outreach other than this today uh, to the non-academics, um, like maybe pitch a story to High Times to reach your target audience, perhaps? <laughs> That's a great, I didn't think about High Times, that was funny. <laughs> um, so uh, the first question was the, the toxicity of the VOCs by themselves, right? Um, so that's not really my area of expertise, but I'm pretty sure that they're not toxic, right? So we have lim limonene, pine smells, the VOCs by themselves, unless they are um, like huge amounts of, because anything in a huge amount of dose is going to kill you, right? Uh, but we never, we're normally not um, introduced to those kinds of levels of VOCs. Now, if, if they react in the atmosphere, then they become harmful. That's correct. So the oxidation of those VOCs in the atmosphere 
make them more harmful. So are they reacting, I guess, is yes. my, you know, and then how, what effect does that have on humanoids? So that's a great question. So there's a lot of VOCs that we do like in our pharmaceuticals, in our makeup, in our clothes, right? We're exposed indoors to lots and lots of VOCs. And yes, they are reactive. They're gonna oxidize in the atmosphere. If there's NOx present and sunlight present, they're gonna form aerosols. I used to do experiments in, in my class where we take limony, that lime smell, and I put a little ozone there and I release limony and you can poof, see particles explode, just form out of nowhere, right? So yeah, that stuff is very reactive. So if there is, a, if you wanna clean the air and you wanna use an ozone generator, please don't do that, right? It'll get rid of all the VOC smells, but it oxidizes those VOCs into uh, things that you don't smell, but are actually more harmful to you, okay? So please don't use an ozone generator. <laughs> Um, my question is, has, do you think the city of Denver, because of the, where these facilities are located, would limit the number of facilities that are in that area or make them build them further out into the country to like less have, lessen the effect that it's having on the city? All right, so right now the, the city of, uh, I'm working with the state of Colorado, and what they'd like to do is, um, have the facilities voluntarily capture the VOCs before they enter the atmosphere, right? Uh, and so, you know, what we're trying to do now is educate these facilities to say, hey, you know what, guys, you know, this stuff can have uh, harmful. And as it turns out, the, <laughs> I love saying, the facilities like to be green, right? right? They want to be environmentally friendly, right? They want to put out this organic stuff, right? And so what we're hoping is through the education of, of them that these things are, could have a harmful impact on on uh, air quality that they would take the opportunity to do control capture. Now it's not very expensive to, like, to capture these VOCs and that would probably be the best thing. I don't think they wanna move their facilities, right, which would be the other thing. And um, I, I don't know about whether they're gonna limit expansion. That could be a way to limit that amount of emissions because we do like permitting for other uh, uh, pollution sources, right, and we say don't exceed after a certain amount. Yeah, have there been studies done on other crops that are produced indoors, industrially. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, like tomatoes or other like horticultural crops that are produced indoors, and do those produce similar levels of uh, VOCs as well? Yeah, so they're very heavily studied. A lot of all the commodity products, both indoor and outdoor, so corn, soybean. As it turns out, you mentioned tomatoes. So tomatoes are huge terpene emitters, right? They produce lots and lots of terpenes, even more so than the marijuana plants. Um, like huge amounts, right? So yeah, we've studied a lot of those. You know, anything that could have a huge impact on, on our air quality, we've studied it to try to make sure, but except for marijuana, right? Except for marijuana. So we have the methods, we know how to do it. Let, the, let us study it and we can figure it out. That's a great presentation, Thank you. by the way. Thank you. I was just making sure I understood you correctly that this is a simple issue to alleviate by using carbon filters and so if the warehouse is in the city or the country it doesn't necessarily matter as long as they're using the proper filter system correct okay oh, okay great yeah so carbon you guys use activated carbon in your brita filters right and so you just run water through carbon carbon's very organic right? and like dissolves like so it wants all the organics that are in your water wants to be absorbed in. same principle in the air so you run air through an, a charcoal filter it grabs all those organics, those VOCs, and puts them into the charcoal. You eventually have to recharge that charcoal, right, and replace it, right? And, and the amount of time and how the charcoal's, you know, geometrically packed optimizes, right, the removal process. And they've done that a lot for man-made VOCs, but nobody's done that for terpenes, for uh, marijuana terpenes. Okay, you've, you've sort of answered the, the, this question to some degree, um, but... This, at, the t at this point, this is sort of basic science. You're building up the data set and figuring out the predictability and all that sort of thing. Um, how would you like your research to be used, specifically policy-wise, but maybe other ways as well? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so my interest is in public health. I'm in the school of public health, right? And so my interest is always geared to helping public health, right? And so what I'd like to do with this um, science that I'm doing now is to educate not only uh, the st folks who are in the state of Colorado from a regulatory standpoint, but also this, you know, the people who are living in these, near these facilities in these communities and the growers themselves, right? Um, I always feel like if people know about a problem, they're more likely to address it, right, and do something about it. 
So foremost in my mind, that's really what I want to, I'm interested in is, is in public health. That's why I do what I do. Um, secondly, as far as the, the science, I think it's, it's, a, you know, it's an area that's very understudied uh, and that I think as a community we can do a lot to contribute to our understanding of that science. Um, and my hope is that people will start realizing this and we start putting the resources that we need to do that. Uh, those are the two things. Yep, sorry. I wanted to add to the point for the carbon filters with the facilities that they have, usually within eight to 12 months, they replace those carbon filters. Are you going in and testing those even though that they're made for uh, man-made VOCs? Yeah, exactly right. So there's only, not every facility in Denver's are doing charcoal, right? And there's maybe one facility that we visited that is trying to do that. And when we measured before and after, they weren't carbon hardly any of the terpenes, right? So I know that's true. And, how, and I asked them, so how did you decide to buy it? Oh, we just went to the vendor, and the vendor said, this is the charcoal filter you should use, right? And so they bought it, right? Now, that vendor sells charcoal filters probably to gas stations and all these other ones, but they've never you know, tried to optimize it for that particular class of compound. So there's some opportunity there. Hey, I was just wondering if there's sufficient um any kind of research on traditional farming compared to this? Oh, that's a good question. So, you know, how would that would affect, uh, yep. Um, no, not that I know of. Like I said, there, <laughs> I mean, I looked prior to what I was doing, you know, I looked far and away and there's hardly anything being done on it. There's a lot more on hemp, right? So they're looking at hemp and you know, how that grows under different kind of practices, but very little has been done on this that I've seen. Um, that'd be an interesting question as well. Most all of our uh, cannabis strains come from six land races. I was just curious to know if you've included that in any of your studies. That, that'd be what I'd like to do eventually, right? I mean, we need to uh, do a systematic way of, of going after this, right? And if we could go back to the, the genus, maybe that'll give us more information across all the strains for each one of those. And that'd be likely. The problem is, <laughs> I mean, ideally what I'd like to do is take these leaf enclosures and go into a facility that have these uh, target strains that I would want. They grow it in their facilities in the optimized way that they do it, not in some garage like I did, right? And we do a real study that way. But I can't get into the facilities, right? I can't, you know, get funding to do that. But that, that would be the way that I would do it in an ideal way, yes. And then uh, I have one last question. Uh, people living in the communities surrounding a lot of these grows, um, the only lawsuits I'm aware of are uh, related to the property value. Are you aware of any lawsuits coming up and coming through? with the air quality issue? Uh, I, not from air quality, but there are issues with smell, right? So that's been a big problem um, from the communities is the smell. And the smell comes from, I think, thiols, which is a sulfur-containing gas, which is, aren't these VOCs, right? So it's a different thing. So if they control for the smell, they may miss this, right? And because of the reactivity of these terpenes, they're very reactive. So as soon as they go into the atmosphere, they're forming the pollution right away. And so the communities that are near these places are going to be the most affected by it. Lots of sunshine. She says 300 days of sunshine in Denver, right? Lots of opportunity to make air pollution. The approach you just mentioned, would hybrids not convolute that a bit? I know they're having issues with potency from that same approach, so would that not yeah, So, Like I said, we don't know. Too? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, you know, hybrids, you know, how does that change the emission rate and the composition? Uh, we just don't have data on that. Yeah, and that, you know, that's part of what we need to do and to get a handle of this industry. What about outdoor farming? Um, any suggestions about sort of like best location to, to have those that will have the, the least impact in the environment? Yeah, absolutely, we could find that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, you saw the, here, nice picture of this model, right? So you see this model, right? These are areas where we have high and low concentrations, right? So we could use these models to optimize the locations for these to have the most minimal impact on air quality. And we know where those places are because we understand the chemistry of this because we've been studying that a long time. So the output of these things we understand pretty well. And so we could optimize, hey, you guys should probably build it here instead of here because this is not downwind of Portland or whatever, right? Uh, and if you build them out in the middle of nowhere, it's not gonna happen, you know. You know the old saying, the, dilution, uh, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So, you know, put it someplace where you can dilute it out. Let's give him one more round oh. of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool stuff, right? Did you learn something? I hope so. Hey, thanks for coming to the Science Cafe tonight.
I hope you enjoyed it. Glad so. Uh, we're here, not in this particular space, every Thursday night. Every Thursday night we host the Science Cafe in the Daily Planet Cafe, just right around the corner over here. So we have great speakers every week getting on stage to share. We get the chance to ask questions. So I hope you'll come back again. Uh, we'll be in the Daily Planet Cafe unless another water main breaks next Thursday night. If you want to know what topics are coming up in the rotation, what speakers are going to be here, in the back, Katie is going to have a clipboard. Uh, just give us your email. We'll add you to the list for this particular event. That way you'll know what's going on at the museum. We want to see you all back here soon. But I will let you know, next Thursday night, it's the first Thursday of December, which means it's Science Trivia Night. So bring your team together. We'll do Science Trivia. You can get a drink at the Daily Planet Cafe and bring your team, compete for prizes and bragging rights all cool science questions. So you don't want to miss that. That's a lot of fun. And then the rest of the Thursdays in the month will be science cafe topics, including one by yours truly. Really? Yeah. Last, yeah, we're going to do a New Year's Eve science celebration. It ought to be a lot of fun I'm bringing in another local comedian to help me. So we'll see you for the science cafe real soon. Good night, everybody. Sure, of course. Not any science background. That, that's a reflection of the air quality.